Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for coming. I'm Michael Ettinger from Ettinger Law Firm. This is our Elder Law Estate Planning Workshop. I'd like to thank you for coming. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about Elder Law and the four major reasons why wills are obsolete, at least for people 60 plus, for seniors. And we have a co-sponsor, fortunately, this evening from Wells Fargo Financial Advisors, C.W. Kelleher, gentleman standing to my left. C.W. is here to help us with the financial and insurance aspects of estate planning. My intention tonight is to cover all the bases. And um, by the time we're done in the next hour or so, I believe you'll have a very good idea of where you stand and what, if anything, you need to do. So let's get started. We're going to hear from C.W. first, C.W. Kelleher, and I'm going to tie his remarks in with mine, and then uh, in about an hour, we'll uh, be done. We like to hold the questions till the end. Is that okay? Everybody agrees? Hold the questions. Usually works much better. Um, for some people, the biggest issue is dessert. <laughs> And even bigger issue is coffee. And that's going to be as soon as I'm done, okay? So it uh, won't be too long. So may I have a warm welcome for C.W. Kelleher, Wells Fargo Financial Advisors. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us here tonight. We certainly appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed your dinner. Uh, as Michael said, my name is C.W. Kelleher, and I'm a Vice President of Investments with Wells Fargo Advisors. Uh, I've been working in the financial services industry for about 16 years, so despite my youthful appearance, I do have quite a bit of experience. Um, we're located at 30 South Pearl Street in downtown Albany, and we are proud to be the financial advisors of choice for the Ettinger Law Firm. Uh, it should be noted that we're financial advisors, we're not attorneys, I'm not here to render legal advice, and Wells Fargo Advisors and Ettinger Law Firm are not related entities, so the opinions that each of us express are our own. Um, and the best part about my talk here tonight is that unlike a lot of seminars you've probably been to with financial advisors, I'm not here, I'm not here to sell you anything, I'm not here to talk about products or services, I'm simply here to introduce you, myself. Uh, I'm here as a second set of eyes. Uh, Wells Fargo Advisors is a non-bank subsidiary of Wells Fargo and Company. We provide advisory services, asset management, brokerage services, estate planning strategies, which Michael will cover, retirement planning, portfolio analysis and monitoring, and other financial services through more than 18,000 registered representatives. By coming here tonight, you have expressed an interest in helping protect and to preserve your assets. Our clients have already accumulated most of the wealth that they're going to have, whether that's $500,000 or $5 million. It's our job as their financial advisors to help steward that wealth in a responsible manner and to help our clients achieve their goals. Again, I'm here tonight simply as a resource, a second set of eyes to make sure you understand the risk, the return, the fees associated with your existing advisory relationship. I ask that you take the opportunity to come in and see us for a second opinion to see if perhaps we may add value to your existing situation. Again, my purpose tonight was just to introduce myself. I'm going to turn the rest of the program over to Michael very shortly, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask if there are any questions about the market or about what we do or how we do it. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, this nice lady at this table over here asked us about our fees. Uh, what do we charge for our investments? Everybody's fee structure is a little bit different, but generally speaking, one percent a year of assets under management is what we charge. Um, our practice is advisory based. We don't charge commissions. Um, usually a flat fee, and it's usually around 1%. Anything else? All right, 
Well, I thank you all for coming tonight, and I am going to turn the rest of the uh, evening over to Michael so he can focus on his agenda. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Thank you, CW. That was short and sweet. Very nice. Um, I'm sure everybody appreciates that, seeing as you know, we're between them and dessert. Uh, I might be a little longer, I'm afraid, but uh, if you would, um, take up your Ettinger folder. It says Ettinger Law Firm on it. And if you open it up, there's a page for notes, so I'll ask you to take that out and just set that aside in case you want to make any notes. Underneath that, there's a review of my book on Amazon entitled Elder Law Estate Planning. So what is Elder Law Estate Planning? It breaks down into estate planning, which has been defined as getting your assets to whom you want, when you want, the way you want, with the least amount of taxes and legal fees possible. And everyone needs an estate plan. Have you looked into the mortality rate lately, anybody? It's alarming. It's, it's 100%, which means everybody needs a plan. It's death planning. Estate planning is death planning. So what is elder law? Elder law is disability planning. And disability planning has become more important because more and more people are becoming disabled. We live an average of 31 years longer than we did a century ago. And what's happening is with everybody living lo lo much longer, about half of all people become disabled unable to handle their affairs, usually later in life. So elder law concerns itself with substitute decision making, powers of attorney for someone to handle legal and financial affairs, health care proxy and living will, medical affairs including end of life decision making. We have the laws about guardianship proceedings for persons who become disabled and then all the rules and regulations about Medicaid. What assets are exempt if you have to go into nursing home? What are you allowed to transfer? How do you plan five years ahead of time with something called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust to protect all your assets? And in this book, I argue it's actually one subject. We call it elder law estate planning because we know 100% of our clients need an estate plan. We know half of our clients need a plan for disability, but we don't know which half. So we have to make sure everybody has it. And I believe the best way to illustrate this point is to explain why wills are obsolete for people 60 plus, and they've been obsolete for more than two decades now. And I'm going to go into the four major reasons why wills are obsolete for seniors, but first, may I ask by a show of hands, how many people here have a will as their current estate plan? Most of you, right? And how many have set up a trust? May I see again? Just a handful. Good, thank you. The first major reason why wills are obsolete is because they take effect when? They take effect when you die. That worked very, very well for hundreds of years, but it doesn't work so well anymore. Today, half of all people become disabled. Now, if you become disabled, does the will help you? No, the will is not a plan for disability. And yet, every year, thousands of people become disabled, so what happens to them? Well, if you don't have a plan for disability, New York State has written a plan for you. You've probably heard of it. It's called guardianship proceedings. If you can't handle your affairs, a judge in Schenectady from, from this county, or a judge from Albany if you're from the next county, or from, uh, from uh, Saratoga County if you're from Saratoga, can step in and appoint someone to handle your affairs for you, called a legal guardian. Now, would anyone here kind of take a guess as to who you think the judge might pick? A lawyer? Good choice. Son or daughter? Well, a lot of the judges feel your sons and daughters have a conflict. What's the conflict? If they spend it on you, it's coming out of their inheritance. So they like to pick somebody independent. Somebody said lawyer, and, and that's true. I've been picked. Let's say you have no, no, no plan for disability and hence the judge has to choose a legal guardian. Now let's say the judge chooses me one day as your legal guardian. The first thing I do is collect up all your assets, your investments, bank accounts, IRAs, life insurance, and move everything over to my good friend C.W. Kelleher 
at Wells Fargo because I'm in charge of the money. I have to put it with a company that I feel comfortable with. I have to put it with an individual I know and I feel comfortable with. So of course I know CW for a long time, very comfortable with him and his firm. And I'm going to tell CW, he goes by CW because he doesn't want anybody to know his name is Cornelius. <laughs> so I'll tell CW, it's guardianship money, put in a guaranteed investment that can't go down. And so the money is safe, and that's not the problem. The problem, as we perceive it, is today a lot of people recover from disability, and it's getting better all the time. People recover from strokes, heart attacks, serious operations. Now, when you recover, do you think you can pay, take back control of your assets whenever you feel ready? What do you think? Not so fast. In this case, there's a court order putting Attorney Ettinger in charge. To get back control, you have to go back to court and have a trial and prove to the judge's satisfaction that you're able to handle your affairs so the judge cancels the order, puts you back in charge. Can you see yourself here? In your late 80s, even 90s, in court, on trial, fighting to get your own assets back? And you know who's opposing you sometimes? The legal guardian. And why is that? You can probably figure that out yourself not a happy place to be and not a place that our clients find themselves because they almost all use trusts and the first reason we like trusts is because they avoid guardianship and the reason trusts avoid guardianship is because unlike a will which takes effect at death a trust takes effect while you're living that's why they call them living trusts and what happens in a trust is you're actually saying my estate starts today not when I die and for now, I'm putting myself in charge. So we call you the trustee of your trust estate. So let's say your name is Mary Jones. We set up the Mary Jones Living Trust, separate entity. We appoint you, Mary, as the trustee. You're the manager. And we name you as the beneficiary, the person who has the use and enjoyment of the trust assets. So you're Mary, trustee of the Mary Trust, beneficiary of the trust is the so-called revocable living trust. Now, for a trust to work, you have to put your assets into it. We do that by retitling assets. So let's say you have a house somewhere here in the Capital District. We prepare a new deed and deed the house from Mary Jones to Mary Jones Trustee, the Mary Jones Trust. Show you how to change your name your investments, your bank accounts, and then everything except IRAs. We'll get to those later. Everything will say Mary Trustee, the Mary Trust. And then you buy and sell the same as before. You file the same income tax return as before. Everything's exactly the same except like tens of millions of people around the country, your assets say Mary, trustee of the Mary Trust. Nothing happens until Mary dies or if she becomes disabled. At the moment, we're talking about disability. What happens if Mary becomes disabled? In the trust, she wrote in, I'm in charge now, but if I become disabled, I name so-and-so to step in. Well, the law in New York says, when you set up a trust, where you name a backup trustee, this defeats a guardianship. The judge cannot appoint a legal guardian for you if you said who you wanted, only if you didn't say who you wanted. So in the event of disability, you're going to get the person or persons you choose. Just a word about powers of attorney here. Powers of attorney are very useful. In a power of attorney, you appoint someone to handle your legal and financial affairs. But powers of attorney do not stop guardianship proceedings. The judge in New York has the power, and often exercises it, to cancel your power of attorney and put somebody else in charge. So power of attorney is useful, but not to stop a guardianship. Fortunately for all of us, the judge has no power to cancel a trust. So a trust guarantees you're going to get the person or persons you choose. We like to say a trust trumps a guardianship, but a guardianship trumps a power of attorney. Now, do you think it's going to make a difference if your people are in charge in the event of disability or the state's in charge? What do you think? Big difference, right? Well, for many reasons, but I'm here to explain the financial reason why it's so important for you to have your own people in charge in the event of disability. But first, a little background. 
In all of these elder law estate plans we prepared over the years, some 20,000 of them now, you folks, you're called the grantors, the people who created trust. You appoint someone in your family or two people acting together and you authorize them in advance to move your assets out of your name if you need long-term care nursing home. It's called the unlimited gifting power. Why do you have to give someone an unlimited gifting power in your elder law estate plan? Because we know if one day that client has to go into a nursing facility, under Medicaid, it's move it or lose it. Well, what do we talk about moving here? Homes, life savings, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, money markets, CDs, savings accounts. So we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they need an unlimited gifting power. And here's how it works. Mary Jones set up the Mary Jones Living Trust. 23 years later, her son comes to see me. He says, Mike, you set up my mom's trust 23 years ago. Now, mom has to go into a nursing home tomorrow. And with the house and everything, she has about 500,000 assets left. Can you help us save anything? I'll say, as a matter of fact, yes. Under the Medicaid law, you're allowed to take half of what she has, well, half of 500,000, we know it's 250,000, gift that to her children, they're adults, of course. As long as we spend the other 250,000 on mom's care, the family gets to keep the 250 gift. Now, how do you make the $250,000 gift? You have the unlimited gifting power. You can move the 250,000, and in this day and age, you can move it tax-free. That's not a taxable gift. We have a name for this technique. It's an advanced elder law te technique, and it's actually a nickname. We call it half a loaf planning. How does the expression go? Half a loaf is what? Better than none. Better than none. That's where we got the expression. So you can always save half, provide your families in charge, and they have the right to move the money. And you have an elder law attorney who knows how to perform the technique. A little later, I'm going to show you how to save the whole thing. But to do that, you have to plan five years ahead of time with something called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. We'll get there. But what if you're the type of person that says, this didn't happen to my parents, so it's not going to happen to me? Or you're the procrastinator. Are there any procrastinators here this evening? <laughs> I thought so. The procrastinator says, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. So you get to the bridge. Where is the bridge? These days, around 87 years old, the average age of a nursing home entrant. Now, you don't have a plan, so the state appoints a legal guardian. Now, let's say you still have that same $500,000. Do you think the legal guardian can take $250,000, gift it to your children for safekeeping? What do you think? No. Not so fast, no. Because once a legal guardian is appointed, they can only spend the money on the person they're guardian for. You have the state's plan spend it on you till there's nothing left. So the first reason we like trust is they avoid guardianship and you avoid the risk the state is going to appoint whoever they choose and that person is simply going to spend it on you till there's nothing left. Now I'd like to share something with you now that took me 20 years to learn. Now, I've been a lawyer since 1980, which you can do the arithmetic, 1980-2015. But the last 24 years has been just elder law estate planning. And it took me 20 years to figure out what I'm going to share with you now. And that's this. In this day and age, in the world we live in, planning for disability is more important than planning for death. The world has changed. Planning for disability is for who? It's for you, right? And planning for death is for who? Them, whoever they may be. Well, you come first. But do you know what they're getting for nursing homes in our area now? <laughs> 12, 13,000 a month? And you have to pay for five years? Does anybody know what that, how much that is? You know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars? If you, if you last that long and if you have that much. So, it may not matter who gets it after you're gone. If you have a care situation, it'll be a moot point. There'll be nothing left. So first, we have to plan for disability. And in my experience, almost everyone wants the same three things if they become disabled. Number one, I want my people in charge, not the state. 
Number two, I want to be able to take back control whenever I feel ready. I don't want to be going to court asking a judge for permission to get my own assets, which permission may be denied. And number three, I don't want to see that nest egg that took me 30, 40, 50 years to put together. I don't want to see it disappear in three or four years because nursing homes are getting the absurd sum of 12, 13,000 a month. So number one reason we like trust is they're an excellent plan for disability. Your people are in charge and they'll act in your best interest. The second reason we like trust is because trusts don't have to go to court to settle and wills do. And what's the name of that legal proceeding to settle a will? Probate. probate. Now, how large do you think your estate has to be to go through probate in New York? 30,000 or more, which is virtually everyone's estate today. So they all go through probate. Now, probate's a legal process to prove the will valid. So when you have a will and it goes to court and it gets filed, do you know that becomes a public record? Do you know that anybody can go down to the courthouse and look up your will and read it and see who your heirs are? But worse than that, you have to file something called an inventory. What's an inventory? It's a list of all your assets. So not only can anybody look up who you left it to, they can look up how much you had and how much everybody is getting. Now, does that sound like a system designed for the year 2015? Is that what people want? Do they want all their assets laid bare in the public domain for anybody going to look up how much you had? Who you... No, it was not designed for today. Do you know who designed the probate system? Henry VIII. <laughs> it's over 500 years old. Today, people prefer to use trust for privacy purposes because if trust doesn't have to be filed in court, nobody can go and look up how much you had. There's no inventory, there's no court proceeding. So nobody knows how much you had or who you left it to except the people named in the trust, the people who you want to know. Well, you might imagine, if we don't have to go to court to settle the estate, we're going to save time and money as well. And it's considerable. At our firm, we get a fee of up to 3% to probate a will. We get up to 1% to settle the trust. So take that $500,000 estate. If I have to probate it, what's 3% of 500,000? 15,000. And same family, same assets. If it's in a trust, I get 1%, which is 5,000. So why is it 15,000 to probate the will, but only 5,000 to settle the trust? The $10,000 difference is the cost of going to court. It's a five-figure item. And for a lot of people, it's a few $10,000 bills they save not going to court. Now what about the time? Well, Kiplinger says it takes an average of two years to probate a will in New York. We've been selling trust now for more than two decades. It takes us weeks or months, but obviously it doesn't take years because we don't have the court proceeding. So you save a lot of time. And there's a, time is important. For example, it's not unusual when someone dies with a will that the executor can't even list the house for sale for two years because until the judge approves the executor, they can't sign a contract to list the house for sale. They're not empowered yet. With a the trust, they could list the house the very next day if they wanted to because they're empowered immediately. So you save a lot of time, you save a lot of money not going to court. You have the privacy aspect, but there's something else. It has to do with control. Do we have any control freaks here this evening? Do you have any people here like to control, you know? Everybody likes control. Well, what happens when you go to the probate court? Who's in charge? The judge, right? Now tell me, does the judge always act in your best interest? No. Yeah. Does the judge ever make a mistake? Yes. Every case I lost, the judge made a mistake. <laughs> And when the judge says jump, your answer has to be what? Oh. How high, Your Honor? Yeah. <laughs> now, with all due respect, if you have to go, you have to go. But here, you don't have to go. Much less, are you going to send your nearest and dearest down to the courthouse to ask a perfect stranger there for permission to get the assets from you? 
Does this sound absurd? Do you know, ARB said this 24 years ago. In 1991, the ARP did a study of the probate system in all 50 states, and they published a report called a Consumer Report on Probate. And here was the conclusion of the ARP report. They said that probate as practiced in the United States today is an anachronism, inappropriate in all but the most exceptional cases. And they advised the membership at the time in 91, 33 million members, to stop using wills, start using trusts. And that's what started a living trust revolution. Since 91, tens of millions of people have set up the trust. Second reason, avoid the expense and delay of a probate court proceeding for my loved ones after I'm gone. Just makes perfect sense. The third of the four reasons why wills are obsolete is that wills don't keep your assets in the blood. They tend to finish their work on the death of the testator, the person who prepared the will. Wills don't go on. Trusts do. And that's important for keeping your assets in the blood. Here's what I'm getting at. Most wills read as follows. To my children, an equal share is per stirpes. Now, per stirpes is a Latin expression. It's used by lawyers. It's a shorthand. It means, if heaven forbid my son or daughter dies before me, I leave their share to their children. Does this sound familiar to you? Yes. Now, did anyone say, if my son or daughter dies before me, I'll leave their share to my son-in-law or daughter-in-law. Did anybody say that? No. But what happens in the real world? In the real world, we know most children survive their parents. So let's say you have a son. I'm going to call him Bobby. And in your will, you leave Bobby $400,000. Parent dies. Bobby gets the $400,000. Unfortunately, three years later, Bobby dies. Who gets the $400,000 from him? Oh, your daughter-in-law. Oops. Can she get remarried? Share your 400000 with a complete stranger? Well, she will, because people live 31 years longer than they did just a century ago. Now, this is not the way people are planning anymore, at least people who see uh, elder law estate planning attorneys. It's been mainstream for uh, at least 15 years at our firm for clients to set up something called an inheritance trust for their sons and daughters to keep the assets in the blood. And here's how they work. Client comes in today, and instead of leaving the 400,000 to Bobby, they set up a Bobby trust. Now there's nothing in the Bobby trust, it's empty. We call this a standby trust because it's standing by till the parent dies. Now, when the parent dies, the 400,000 gets paid to the Bobby trust, and you appoint Bobby as the trustee. And you say, Bobby, we left your money in the Bobby Trust, and you're in charge. And under the trust, you can do whatever you want with the money. You could spend the whole thing. So we're not ruling from the grave. It's his money. He can do whatever he wants with it. But the trust has three benefits for him. Tell me if this makes sense to you. First, it says, Bobby, if you happen to get divorced. What's the divorce rate today? Maybe half? Spouse can't touch it, separate property, protected by the trust. Well, it already makes sense. It says something else. It says, Bobby, if you get sued, who gets sued today in this country? Everybody, right? Creditors can't touch it. Not his name, not his social security number, lawsuit proof. But the third thing, and the main reason people set up the Bobby Trust, this trust says, Bobby, when you die, could be five years after me or 50 years after me. Whatever you didn't spend, is still in my trust. So I direct whatever you don't spend goes to your children, in other words, my grandchildren. What if he doesn't have children? Then it goes to Billy and Mary, the brother and sister. Then it goes to nieces and nephews. Always passes by blood instead of by marriage. Keeps your money and your family for generations to come. Does this sound like a good idea? It must be. This is what most people do. I've done this myself for over 10,000 people and uh, I'm only one of six lawyers in the firm, so I know it's very well thought of. Fairly standard today if you're leaving um, any uh, sizable uh, gift, and we can talk about that in the office. So unlike a will which stops at death, what the inheritance trusts do is they carry your wishes out 30, 40, 50 years after you're gone, 
Protect the inheritance from children's divorces, lawsuits, and creditors. And then finally, pass it by blood instead of by marriage. Keeps your money and your family for generations to come. And then what's the fourth and final reason why wills are obsolete? Well, now we're coming full circle. Wills are obsolete because they do absolutely nothing to protect your assets from a nursing home stay. So you have the will. You name the executor, the uh, successor executor. You have the heirs, the percentages. It's in a nice envelope, perhaps with calligraphy on the cover. But unfortunately, client went into a nursing facility. Nursing home got everything. The family got nothing. You know what that plan reminds me of? Do you remember the old saying, the operation was a success, but the patient died? Well, it's exactly the same thing. I had a wonderful estate plan, except there was no estate left at the end of the day. Well, that doesn't make much sense. We built this firm, Ettinger Law Firm, on the premise that for an estate plan to be effective, it has to have a means or a method to protect the assets of nursing home costs, and virtually all of our clients have it, because we started with that premise. And when we started back in 91, nursing homes were two to 3,000 a month. But almost all of our clients have it because it's not very difficult to protect your assets from nursing home. You have two options. We call them plan A and plan B. Plan A, long-term care insurance, which is one of the reasons why CW is here. He's qualified in that area, and I am not. And we want to cover all the bases. And plan B is the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. So our clients choose plan A or plan B. Let's see which plan works for you. First, long-term care insurance. May I ask again, by a show of hands, please, how many people here have taken out long-term care insurance? Three or four out of seven. seventy. Well, that's the way it is. Long-term care insurance is the way to go if you can swing it. We favor long-term care insurance for a couple of reasons. Number one is it helps you afford to stay in your own home so you can quote, age in place. The trend today is to age in place. This can stretch your dollars for years longer than you might be able to stay in your home if you didn't have the long-term care insurance. For, so for number one reason is so you can afford to stay in your own home with home care. The second reason is if you have a spouse. One day, your spouse may become disabled. And disabled is a term of art. It means unable to perform any two or more of the activities of daily living. They're called the ADLs, activities of daily living. There's six of them, washing, dressing, toileting, transferring, feeding, and continence. If you can't perform two or more of the activities of daily living, you're considered disabled. Now what if it's your spouse one day? You find that fairly quickly, it can cost you four, five, six thousand a month to bring somebody in. Well, a lot of people, when they find out how much it costs to bring in help, get scared. They say, if I start spending that kind of money, I may not have enough left for myself. So I'm going to try and do it on my own. Well, Alzheimer's Association commissioned a study on this. And do you know what they found out? Do you know that over 60% of spouse caregivers die first? Why is that? Stress, Stress right? I call it a perfect storm. The caregiver is not in their 50s or 60s. The caregiver is in their 80s or 90s. The job is 24-7, 365. And as you know, it's a very hard job. So no wonder the grim statistics. It turns out, if you're unable to perform any two or more of the activities of daily living, that triggers the benefit under the long-term care policy. Now the insurance company sends the caregiver Husband and wife is supervising, but somebody else is doing the heavy lifting. They don't wear themselves out, and they get respite. What's respite? A break, right? So I encourage you to look into long-term care insurance. You'll have the opportunity when we're done to check off that you want to uh, have a long-term care insurance consultation. That'll be with CW. And basically, he will um, help you determine based on your income and your assets and your age and some health-related questions, 
how much insurance you need, how much you can afford. He'll shop it around, get you four or five quotes, review them with you, and then between you and your advisor, you'll make a business decision. It's not a legal decision, is it? It's a business decision. Are you going to insure against that risk by paying that premium, or are you going to go another route? So you'll have the opportunity to have that worked up and make your business decision for yourself. I know for a fact, however, that the majority of people are not going to get long-term care insurance for one of three reasons. What are the three reasons? They're not cost, cost, and cost, but I know how you feel about that. Certainly cost. What are the other two? Health. Thank you very much. A lot of people get turned down for even minor health issues. And then what's the, the, the third one? Age. As a practical matter, these days 70 is not very old, but for long-term care insurance, the train has left the station. <laughs> Clients don't purchase it after 70 simply because the premiums become what clients consider outlandish, more than they want to spend. So I've noticed in the practice over 70 people don't buy it. So if you're 70-ish, um, give or take, and you don't have long-term care insurance, or you're younger but you've been turned down, or you know you won't qualify for medical reasons, or you simply can't afford it, you must look by default at Plan B, the Irrevocable Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Now, the Medicaid Trust has been around for a long time. I've been a lawyer in this state for 35 years. The Medicaid Trust was there before I started. So for more than 35 years, You've been allowed to put your home and life savings into a trust and protect them subject to the five-year look back. You know you have to do it five years ahead of time, right? Because they can look back five years. So let's look at how, they, how these trusts work. Let's go back to the revocable living trust. Revocable living trusts are wonderful tools. They avoid probate. They avoid guardianship. They help keep assets in the blood. But the one thing a revocable living trust doesn't do it doesn't protect assets from a nursing home because you can take it out at any time. So if you have to go into a nursing home, let's say, Mary, you can take it out, so take it out and give it to us. If you can get it, they could get it. So starting at 70 plus, people set up a different type of trust, the irrevocable Medicaid trust, which creates two roadblocks that Medicaid and nursing homes simply cannot break through. The first roadblock is you must name someone else as the trustee and people almost always choose one or more of the adult children because Medicaid and nursing homes have no control over them. So son or daughter are both as trustees. And the second roadblock is in a Medicaid trust, you must limit yourself to the income only. You put in stocks, you only get the dividends. CDs, you only get the interest. You put in your home, you get the right to live there. Exclusive right to use and enjoy the premises. What happens to these assets? They stay in the trust, and then they go to your heirs free of the expense and delay of a probate. So who's setting up these trusts and why are they doing it? Well, I can tell you because Ettinger Law Firm has set up more of these than any other firm in the state. It's clients 70 plus. Generally have a lot of assets you're not going to spend like your home. For heaven's sakes, move to protect the home. What happens if you own a home and you need long-term care? Anybody? They put a lien on it. It's not unusual for the lien to exceed the, the value of the house, and the house goes to Medicaid. Well, that hardly makes sense when we know for more than 35 years you're allowed to put that house in a trust, and any time after five years you have to go into nursing home, they can't touch it. What if you don't make the five years? What if four years go by and you have to go into nursing home? What happens? In that case, you only have to pay for one year. You already have the four. It always pays to get started. So protect your house. Now you put your house in the trust, can you sell it? Yes. The trust sells the house. The money's paid to the trust. The money's protected. Can the trust go out and buy a condo? Sure. The trust can buy a condo. It's still protected. You don't start the five years over again because the trust sold the house and bought the condo. It stayed inside the trust. So protect your homes. Now, certain assets are exempt from Medicaid. IRA, 401k, 403b, TIACRAF, TRA, TDA, 457, Keo, 
any qualified plan, in other words, deferred to 70 and a half, the principal is exempt from Medicaid. Not only can't they touch your IRA, but it's also protected from probate. IRAs don't go through probate. They have a designated beneficiary. They go right to the person name. So is an IRA part of your state plan? Well, yes, it is, because what we do with the IRA is we name the sons and daughters inheritance trusts as the beneficiary, so we protect that IRA money from their divorces, lawsuits, and creditors passed by blood instead of by marriage. So the IRA is part of the state plan, but it's not part of the Medicaid Asset Protection Plan. Now, if you're in a nursing home, you're probably over 70 and a half. And you know what that means. You're taking your required minimum distribution. The facility gets that because you have to take it. comes out as income. They get that. Is that 12, 13,000 a month? No. Might be a couple of thousand a month. So that's all they can get, the required minimum distribution. The principal is protected. So your IRA is protected, but what about your non-IRA? And this is what I would really like to know from each, each of you here this evening. Do you have a nest egg that's not IRA money? Now it could be stocks, bonds, mutual funds, CD, money market, savings accounts. I want to know if you have a nest egg, do you need that nest egg to live on? Now let's say it's $400,000 for argument's sake. A lot of clients tell me, Mike, we don't need that 400,000, it's there just in case we have enough income. A lot of clients say, well, we're just taking the interest, or we're just taking the dividends. Do you realize, if you're 70, give or take, or older, and you have that nest egg that you don't need to live on, you're actually safe keeping it for the nursing home industry. Well, what happens, and we see this every day, of course, in the other law practice, Client 70 something has the 400,000, not spending it, so one day they get to 85, 86, 87. Client has to go into a nursing home. Over in the business office at that facility, they're jumping up and down. Why? You're going to be paying them 12, 13,000 a month. Now, three quarters of the residents in that facility are on Medicaid. Are these poor folk? No. Middle class people who already spent down all their assets at twelve, thirteen thousand a month, or they sheltered them with a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. So for the three quarters on Medicaid, is Medicaid paying the facility twelve, thirteen thousand a month? No. Are you getting the same care as everyone else? Sure. So they just hit a home run with your money. Well, totally unnecessary when we know it's been the law in this state for more than thirty-five years. You can take that four hundred thousand, put it in the Medicaid trust, still there if you need it somebody else can come and take it away from you. Now a few things I'd like you to know about the Medicaid trust. You name son or daughter both as the trustee, but you've been around. You know things can change. So you reserve the right to change the trustee at any time. That keeps them on the straight and narrow. Now, I said you cannot take principal out of a Medicaid trust. The reason being, if you could get it, they could get it. So you can't get principal. But what if one day you decided that you, want, you needed $30,000 to take your whole family and your lawyer on a round-the-world trip? <laughs> well, you can't take out $30,000 for yourself. But did you know you're allowed to make a gift out to your sons and daughters because Medicaid sees what you put into the trust, because that was a transfer from you. But they don't see what the trust gave to somebody else. You can make gifts from the trust. You can gift your son or daughter 30000 Can they give it back to you? No, because they can trace that to the trust, and you're done. Can they go and, and, and pay a travel agent for a trip for you around the world? It's their money. They can do whatever they want. So that's something good to know. So you can use the gifting power. The other thing is, a lot of people are uncomfortable setting up something called an irrevocable trust until they find out in New York you can revoke an irrevocable trust. <laughs> well, how could that be? Well, it makes perfect sense to a lawyer, and let me explain. It's irrevocable because you folks, you're called the grantors, you can't revoke it yourself. So the law says as far as you're concerned it's irrevocable. But New York has another law in the books that says, if you, the people, set up the trust, the grantors, and the people named as trustees to manage it, one or more of the children, 
My people named his beneficiaries to get it after God and the rest of the children. In other words, if every person named in an irrevocable trust agrees in writing they didn't, that they no longer want the trust, you may revoke it on the written consent of all the named parties. What if one of them won't sign? Not a problem. First we amend the trust, we take their name out of it, and then we revoke it on consent <laughs> of the named parties. So, should you have a trust, should you have a trust, revocable, irrevocable? We don't know, but we're going to try to find out. Let me ask you to now go into your pack, excuse me, go into your packet again. On the right side, in the back, there's a blue form and a pink form. I'd like you to please take both of those out, blue and pink. And if you'd be so kind, put the blue one on top. We're going to talk about that first. Everybody got that? This is your confidential planning survey. This is the one you fill out at home and you bring into the office for your free consultation on elder law estate planning. But let's look at it, okay? Uh, it asks you for your name, spouse if you have one. If you're single, I wrote a chapter in my book on estate planning for singles. There's plenty to talk about there. Your children, of course, are adults, but put their names down. And then at the bottom, you'll see it says, your primary planning concerns are, and check all that apply. So let's look at those. Planning for disability might be a good idea to check that. Elimination of probate, I noticed everybody checks that. Keeping assets in the blood, do you want to keep it in the blood for your grandchildren? Check that. We'll talk about the inheritance trust. Planning for elderly parents. If you have parents who are living and they have assets, you could already be protecting or saving $12,000, 13000 a month for the Medicaid trust, it always pays to get started. Whatever time you get under your belt is time you don't have to pay for. Providing for disabled heirs. If you have a special needs child or grandchild, we'd like to talk to you about a special needs trust so that if they get an inheritance, they don't lose their Social Security Medicaid benefits. The special needs trust pays over and above what the government's paying for the special needs child. Top right, protecting assets for nursing home costs. If you want to talk about the Medicaid trust, that's where you check that. Protecting assets from spouses remarriage. What's that about? Especially for ladies. Do we have any wives here this evening? Wives, can I have your attention? Ladies, if something happens to you, he's a chick magnet. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard the one about the fellows walking down the hall in a nursing home? Woman uh, catches sight of him and she gets all excited. So she stops him and says, hey, fella, you look like you're new around here. I haven't seen you before. He goes, yeah. He says, I just got out of jail. I was in there for 20 years for murdering my wife. <laughs> she goes, so you're single. <laughs> OK, so the reason we bring it up in this context is because with a trust, it's rather easy to protect it from spouse's remarriage. So it doesn't end up with wife number two. It ends up with your children. That's what trust can do. Divorce and creditor protection for the inheritance. If your son or daughter is in a shaky marriage, even if they're not, 50% of marriages break up. It doesn't look shaky. But between the time we see the client at the first meeting and the time we see them in the second meeting, they tell us they got the call. You know what the call is. We're splitting. You know? So 50%, I say, protected from divorces. If they're in a, a high-risk business or profession, protected from lawsuits and creditors. It's very easy to set up an inheritance trust. What about this one? Protecting children from poor spending habits. Is there anyone here this evening who has children with poor spending habits? All rise. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then finally, may I ask by a show of hands, how many people here own property outside New York? Let me see that. Property outside New York? Good, thank you. Where's that? Vermont. Vermont, yeah. North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. Where's that? Bahamas. Bahamas, yeah. If you own property in another state and you have a will, do you know we have to probate the will in New York and North Carolina, New York and Vermont? I'm not sure what happens to the Bahamas. <laughs> Nothing good, you know, when it comes to this sort of thing. When you set up a trust, you can deed the property from all 50 states into the trust, avoid all the probates. 
And I'll talk to you about the Bahamas. You're going to have to check there. But you want to make sure you don't have to probate in the Bahamas because you can be tied up for years with something like that. It's called the multiple probate problem, and it's something you avoid ahead of time with a trust. Now, if you would open your uh, blue form up, inside you'll see there's some yes, no questions. Tells you what to bring with you. Bring your current will, trust if you have one. Power of attorney, health proxy, living will. Deeds and real estate tax bills, because if we're going to set up a trust, we want to deed the property into the trust. Statements from brokerage accounts, long-term care policies. And then fill out the financial information. This will take you 10 or 15 minutes, but you're not filling it out for us at Ettinger Law Firm. You're filling it out for yourself because if you bring us the right information, we'll be able to give you the correct advice. So it's in your interest to so take the time. Now what happens in the estate planning process? Well, if it goes full term, there's three meetings. And it's very low key. In the first meeting, we're getting to know each other. What's important to you? We review your blue form. We see your sons and daughters' names there. What kind of work do they do? Are they married? What's your son-in-law's name, daughter-in-law's name, grandchildren? How old are they? What are their names? And what's the family dynamic? Now this is easy because everyone knows their family. So it only takes 10 or 15 minutes to get to know your family from your point of view. Look at your assets, look at your income right in front of us, and look at your current plan and see, does the thing fit together? Now, our firm has a reputation. We've been in business since 91, it's 24 years. And everybody knows this about us. If you don't need it, we'll tell you. If you should wait, we'll tell you, and we'll tell you why and how long. If you should do it somewhere else, we'll tell you that as well, where and why. If we think you should do something with us now, we'll also say that, and we'll make our recommendations. And we give you a, a free copy of my book when you come in for the consultation. It's partly thank you for coming. And also, for making recommendations, we're going to advise you, please read these chapters, 1 to 6 and 20, or whatever applies to your situation. And we'll tell you how much the fees will be for what we're rec recommending. We're not doing business in the first meeting. We're exploring. So generally, we'll make another meeting about three weeks later. You've read the chapters, big print, short chapters. Um, and, and so we answer any questions you have about the reading. You thought about the proposal, brought in any missing paperwork. And we answer any questions you have. And we draft an estate plan together with you, and we now prepare a two-page proposal in writing. Here's in detail what we're going to do. Here's our fees reduced to writing. Now, by that time, most people know what they want to do. Unfortunately, many people say, it sounds like a good idea. Let's go ahead. And we'll say, that's fine. Thank you. Don't give us any money now. We're going to go ahead, prepare the estate plan, come in another three weeks or so, make another appointment. You come in, you review the documents, which is your trust, inheritance trust, Healthcare proxy, living will, power of attorney. Pour over will. You get a will with a trust called a pour over will, P O U R. Cancels the old will as a matter of law, so you can forget about it. And it says, in case you left something out of the trust, pour it in there after you're gone. And then once everything is done and you're satisfied, you pay the fee once at the end. A perfect system. You're always in the driver's seat exactly where we want you to be. You're always comfortable. You don't pay anything until it's done and you're satisfied. And we like it from our point of view as well because once somebody pays us, we want to make sure that that client is 100% happy and comfortable because we don't say goodbye at Ettinger Law Firm. After you pay us, we actually say hello. We're starting a relationship now because we trademarked the process in 1999 so that's what, 16 years ago, designed to make sure the Ettinger plan works when you need it. It's called the Ettinger Elder Law Estate Planning Process. And unlike other firms, and I'm not knocking other firms, this is just the standard in New York State, when you sign they say goodbye. Well, that means a lot of those plans aren't gonna work when you need them. So instead of saying goodbye, we say hello, and we have a system to make sure it works when you need it. And here's how we do it. First, in our computers, we have a proprietary software program that tracks all our plans for law changes so that if there's a law change, the computer can search the whole database, tells us which client applies to, and sends you the letter. So you never have to worry if you're legally up to date. We're tracking that. 
Once a week, we send out a law letter called the Ettinger Elder Alert because it comes by email. We get very good information into the firm. It's not always legal. It could be legal, medical, social, financial. But we publish one major article a week. We won an award for that newsletter. Clients really like it because we get information that they wouldn't otherwise have. Every two years, we invite all our clients to breakfast. We update you on the law, what's happening in the firm. We invite your next of kin to meet the lawyer. We're building the relationship. But the key is this, the last thing. Every three years, we send each of you a letter in the mail. Time to come in for your free review. Why do we have a free review every three years? Because we have no other way of knowing. Did your health change? Have your assets changed? Your family, births, deaths, marriage, divorces? And here's how it works. People come in after three years. You know, very few people need a change. So we just talk a little bit, you know, catch up with each other. Make sure to tell you how much younger you look than last time we saw you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. See you next time. After see, no, no, I'm not finished. <laughs> There's a fellow who wants dessert. Okay, right. I'm almost done. Very good. After six years, now actually more people need a change. But do you know that statistically, almost no one get, can get past nine or 12 years without needing a major change, who's in charge, who they're leaving it to, something else happens. You do an amendment, and the amendment you pay for, today's money, $500. Well, you don't pay it unless you want to do it, of course. So you do an amendment, you're good to go. The point is, the Ettinger plan is never more than three years old. Designed to work when you need it. Not when you wrote it, it could be decades earlier. Very effective, our clients love it. And we save countless people, countless problems, but there's a nice side effect when something bad happens. You know, a client has to go into nursing home, client passes away. We know who the client is, the staff knows. When you come in, we've seen the average client eight or nine times. Makes a big difference, it's the way it should be. I think it should be the standard, and I believe one day it will be the standard, but we've already been doing it now for 20,000 clients for now, uh, what's, what's more than a, a decade and a half. All right, so thank you so much for coming. Have a very nice evening. Hope to see you all very soon.